So to begin with, can I ask the mobile phones to turn off or put on silent whilst the meeting is, is uh, happening? Um, I'm not aware of any fire drill, so if anything happens and you hear the alarm, then we're to make our way um, out of the building. Before we begin, um, there's a few items that I want to raise. Um, apologies, first of all, for the confusion about uh, Professor Thompson from the university. Um, sadly, he can't be with us today. Um, also, apologies from Roger McKenzie, who would have loved to have been here today. I understand that he, he does a lot of work with uh, Martha, uh, Martha Osama, but uh, sadly, he can't be here. So, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming along. Uh, I'm pleased to see that so many people have turned up today for such a, an important debate. Um, the debate today is about um, the Windrush Solidarity. And what I'd like to say first of all is, my name is Amanda Pinnock and I'll be chairing the meeting. I'm a, a councillor, a Kirkland's councillor. I'm also a housing solicitor, I work for Fusion Housing. But I'm also the only and first black councillor at Kirkland's which is both alarming and disappointing. And what I'd like to do today, at the beginning of this meeting, is to appeal to anybody who's interested in wanting to put themselves forward to be a councillor. Please do so. We need the representation in our community. If you know Kirklees, you know there's a wealth of African and African Caribbean uh, people living in Kirklees, and we need to be represented. It's not enough that there's one, we need more. So if you are interested, I want any information, any advice, come and see me after the meeting or we can have a chat. So today, um, what we have is, we have guest speakers who have come along today to talk about this interesting debate. We have uh, Martha Osama, who's come all the way from um, Tottenham. Um, she's an equalities opportunity leader and a Unite activist. And we have Andrew Thompson, who is a, a unison steward and equality officer for Kirk Leeds. So hopefully we can have a really interesting debate. Once we've heard from the speakers, um, we'll open the floor, so if anybody has any questions or you know, if, if they want to make any statements, then by all means do so. I'm interested to hear what everybody has to say, because everything um, is valuable uh, and we need to hear. But just to begin by saying that this particular topic is important because of this uh, government's um, hostile environment that's been created in respect of immigration laws, policies and procedures which has affected a certain group called the Windrush Generation. <coughs> and when we talk about the Windrush Generation, what we're referring to is a group of people from the Commonwealth who were invited to come to Britain after the Second World War to help make Britain good again to help kickstart the economy and these people were invited from various places such as the Caribbean, from Africa, from Asia um, to come and as I say to work in this country um, where in areas where they just couldn't get the employment um, in particular the NHS which was very new um, around uh, the late 1940s where the government at the time um, introduced um, a system where people uh, have the opportunity to receive medical care irrespective of those, their social economic background that it was free of the point of delivery and to be able to deliver such a service um, they needed to make sure they had the staff to do that so that was one of the areas where people from the commonwealth were invited to come across and work in there were other areas such as transport public transport and of course in the mills and the factories and I am from that generation. Um, my grandfather is um, from the Windrush generation and he came across, like so many others, from the Caribbean and he left his family um, to come here in search of a better life for his family. And when people from the Windrush were invited here, they were given an assurance that they could come and work here and live here and be British and be given um, the opportunity to enjoy the spoils of the land. And people came here between the period 1940 to 1973 um, and that's exactly what happened they came here they made a lot of sacrifices to come by leaving their by leaving their family behind to come and work to rebuild the infrastructure uh, of britain but we're here today to talk about what's gone on recently uh, in particular in the media and what the debates that have been happening 
uh, with our MPs in Parliament. And that's about the hostile environment of this government basically um, affecting this group of, of people who have been invited here um, to stay um, and were classed as um, having status to remain here. What we've learned from the media is that there are certain individuals who are from the Windrush <coughs> generation who have been directly affected by these, this hostile policy. And some of those things include people losing their jobs. Um, in other areas, people have been made homeless um, because of certain, um, for example, the Immigration Act 2014, which basically says landlords are not allowed uh, to rent properties to people who don't have the correct immigration status and they face fines and imprisonment. There's also other um, procedures and policies which affect groups like the Windrush generation, such as um, you know, driving license restrictions, uh, banks and building societies doing checks, find making it harder for people to have bank accounts. Um, and there have been other situations where people have actually died as a direct consequence of these hostile, um, this hostile policy. So how has it affected the Windrush generation then? Well, my understanding of how this has come about is that the government created um, these policies which have affected this group. And what's happened is there are certain people who are from the Windrush generation who they say have to prove their status, have to prove that they are from that period between um, 1940 and 1973. And obviously at that time when people arrived here and they were given the invitation that they could stay and live here and have their families join them over here, there was no reason in reality to keep any records or any documents. Um, and what you'd expect in reality is for the government to have kept those records. But as we've learned from the media, um, the Home Office at some point destroyed some of the landing cards, although it came to light that some of the landing cards weren't destroyed, so it's not clear what the situation is. But people who are affected by this are finding it very difficult to prove their status, which has resulted in people being deported. And we know that more than 7,000 people have been returned to countries such as Pakistan, Nigeria, Ghana, Sri Lanka, Jamaica on chartered flights escorted by security officials since 2010. And it's not clear how many of those people are from the Windrush generation who were invited here to stay here and live here. So there are a lot of issues. Um, the media has uh, brought these things to the forefront. And it's just a shame that we're only now learning about these things. These things have been ongoing, my understanding, since before 2010. And there has been a lot of people who have suffered in silence. But uh, now that we're all more aware of what's going on, we're abreast of what's been happening, this is an opportunity for us to have a debate, an opportunity for us to talk about um, what the issues are, and really to lobby our MP, lobby the government, to make sure that people's rights are safeguarded. So, we're going to hear from the first speaker, uh, Andrew Thompson, and then we're going to hear from Martha Osserman. What I'd also like to do as well is hear from a friend of mine, Denzel Nurse. I've asked him to come along today. And the reason why I've invited Denzel in particular to come and say a few words is that my understanding is back in the 80s, in the 1980s, <coughs> although people from the Windrush were invited to come to the, the UK, um, in the 80s, the government requested that people register to become citizens of the UK. And um, Denzel and a group of others were involved in ensuring that people from the Black and Caribbean community um, were registered. And I know he has an interesting story to tell about the logistics of that, so maybe Denzel can uh, go into more detail about that later on. But also, I, I, what, what I want to say is, for me, what I want to get out of this debate is obviously I want to hear from the speakers and hear from everyone here to contribute. But more importantly, one of the outcomes I'd like to see is what I mentioned earlier, you know, people are interested in putting themselves forward to be a councillor. But also, I want an assurance from Kirklees that they will put adequate resources into supporting people in Kirklees who are affected by this hostile uh, immigration policy. And um, what I'd like is for Kirklees to commit to that 
um, and to work with myself and anybody else in the community who's interested to support um, that going forward. And for me personally, one of the reasons why I became a counsellor is for reasons like this. I want to highlight injustices that are happening in the community and everywhere. And I think, I feel I have a responsibility to do that. And I think if people don't stand up and say when something is wrong, then we're not really doing our job as a citizen. We're here to support each other. So anybody who's interested in putting themselves forward, I'm going to keep banging on about it. <laughs> but <laughs> we need you. We need you to come forward and show your support. So we'll hear from Andrew first. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Just got to say, I find myself in a bit of a similar position. I'm part Asian, Burmese by birth. My grandma was from Burma. Met my granddad who were in the army out there. The war happened, and my granddad, in his own words, shipped her out, got her out of Burma and sent her to England. Now, she was a big part of my life for over 40 years. The one thing I never thought about asking my grandma was she a British, a British citizen. I never, never, never knew that. And unfortunately, now I cannot answer that because she uh, died 10, 12 years ago. So does that make me the grandson of an illegal immigrant? Does that make me the grandson of a British citizen? I don't know. Does that make me illegal? Does it make me, because she would be dad's, on my dad's side, does that make me dad illegal? Again, question I'll never be able to answer. We've also got to look back at um, Martin Luther King who fought for a lot of things in America. Racism, fought against racism, stood up against, to fight for what he wanted and stood and believed and to help people out there. And we're still suffering the racism today, especially in his workplace, especially in my workplace, where we're constantly getting, or we're constantly getting racist comments made to us, bringing them to man management's attention, and they've just been totally ignoring us. So does that make them as bad as racist people making the racist comments? To my eyes, it does. It's, it's not just going on in our workplace; it's going on in workplaces across the across the country, all over the place. We've just had a ballot part of our ballot to do with the race comments and bullying and harassment from management. This has gone on for the last two or three years now, and the management have never listened until we've got this ballot in. They've now suddenly started to make a move on it because of what we got. We got a massive yes vote on a massive return, an 86.1% return and an 85% yes vote. So management are now suddenly talking and wanting to know about this. As I said, the race, racism just continues and continues. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop in the workplace. It's out on the street as well. People are forever at it. We're not just seeing it on the street. We're seeing it on social media now. It's, it's getting bigger and bigger. People, I think it's becoming more and more pre relevant now. Where you're seeing it, who you're seeing it by, and people filming it. And it's just constant. And I think it's now time to slow up and do something. Thank you. for asking me to come to Huddersfield. This is my first time of coming to Huddersfield. I've been to Leeds uh, quite a few times, but I haven't been here. And um, how did I manage <coughs> to get to come to Huddersfield? I didn't invite myself. I was invited by one of you who works in London, but come from Huddersfield. So his family and his heart is here. So when we just see him like the others as the ones who spend time in London and spend you know, the good time in Huddersfield. <laughs> so when he's um, amongst you at the back, there that's Paul, Come on, get up so that they can see what we hear. Paul is um, one of our trustees in Harry Law Center. I'm um, the chair of the of Harry Law Center. And uh, he asked me to come so that we can share you know, our ideas. And that's what we've always done. 
we try to share. And um, when you talk about wind wash, you cannot talk about it without talking about immigration, without talking about who is an immigrant, and without talking about why is it that those who are immigrants are different. There's different treatments for different immigrants. And we cannot forget that. Because if we do, then we're not doing justice to what is historically wrong. So who are these people who got on the Windrush, Empire Windrush boat to come to the UK? They were the children and grandchildren, great grandchildren of those Africans who were removed from Africa and took to the Caribbean. So um, you can just picture it. Their ancestors, they didn't freely get on the boat to go to the Caribbean. They were the enslaved people. They captured them and chained them onto those boats and traveled from Africa, the different countries of Africa, they took them. They were well fed, strong, still strong enough when they got to the Caribbean to be growing things and working for their masters and, you know, like slavery. That's, that's what it was. They didn't pay them anything. They didn't give them a return ticket. So their children stayed in that captivity until they were so sort of freed. The masters got money, they got really paid well for losing their slaves. The slaves didn't get a penny, but they found their way to survive. Then Europe got themselves into some war among themselves. At the end of that war, they needed to rebuild. And what did they do? They went to the Caribbean, filled up the Windrush, and Empire Windrush, and brought them here. When they came here, unlike those ones that were taken to Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, where they would give them a place you know, to settle down and then eat, gradually get them a job and get them home, they were let out in a very hostile environment. This hostility we're talking about is nothing compared to that hostility that they faced. Because they couldn't even get a place to live. Because the advert would say no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. And they used the N word, most of us who came from the same, you know, colonized places, they didn't even know what that N word meant. That means that we will see a room advertised and says they don't want that, they don't want Irish, they don't want no dog. But that other one, you didn't know it's you that they meant. So you go and knock on the door and they tell you, can't you read? And the door is banned. And they go to look for work. And the same thing happened. But they survived. But they were British citizens. And when they were coming and where they were conditioned meant that this place was the motherland. Can you imagine? Enslave you, shackle you, free you in their own words, and then say to you that there is the motherland that belongs to all of us. That means that you dress in a like the queen mother, you put the picture of the prince and everything in the house, and you pray to the Christian God and everything. You did all that and you prepared yourself to come to the motherland. But what happens when you get to the motherland, then you then realize actually that you are not wanted. 
So, brothers and sisters, it has not changed. It's still the same thing that we hear today, especially when we're talking about Europe. You know, we know who it is <coughs> that when we take over our country, we know who we don't want to be in that country. And that is why it is important you know, for us when we have a meeting like this and my sister here is saying something very important and that's what we've been saying all the time, engage. Become a counselor, she said. Yeah? And I even say more than that, don't just become a counselor. Become a representative in anywhere you are. In the resident association, in the school governors, in your trade union, because the structure we are in is an organized structure. If you are not a member of your union and you are not active to know what is happening there, right? You could be working in a place for so many years and nobody will take any notice of your rights. So if you don't involve yourself and change it in your residence association when they have their meeting in the tenants room and they decide what's going to happen in that estate, you know, how the police are going to behave when they come to look for young people and so on and so forth. If you are not represented in those places, you can't actually make any change to stop things from happening. Then, of course, being a counselor, right, which is very important. You know, you just had a very good election. Thank you for bringing Labour back in this place. I hear you've got a good majority now. Yes, I'm, I'm you know, from the Labour Party, and that's why. I am so happy that you've done that. And then you say, you know, become a counselor. Of course. Who makes the decision? Who decides, you know, who, how many times your street is clean, the library that is going to be closed, you know, and, and so on, the housing and all those things. It's the counselor who make that decision. And it's not, in, you know, it's not helpful if we don't engage. Even if you're not a counselor, you can still be active in your community to make sure that the councillors get what they need to make good decisions that will be good for the whole community and all of us. So, having said that, I think that what we need to be looking at in terms of the change to make sure that what happened to the wind rush generation doesn't happen again. It's not just only that we want to be in, in a position to make that decision. It's that we want to be in a position where we become our brothers and sisters keepers, you know, where we are able to know what is happening. And when we listen and hear the news, because all, all these things that we're talking about now, they went you know, secret. For example, I come from Nigeria in 1963. The passport that I came with, because Nigeria had just had independence, was still almost like a British, a British passport. I was a British sub, um, the Queen's subject, which meant that I could you know, work, my husband could work, and um, we could, if we finish our studies and want to go home, claim our taxes to help us go back, yeah? They changed all that. Students don't work anymore and study. They stopped it. They didn't hide it. It was a law that says, you know, that the students have to work, yeah? We didn't, well, we campaigned against it, but a lot of people just thought, well, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't mean anything. So then they introduced other immigration laws, which actually affected a lot of people. You know, meant you know, that they had you know, to change and, and their, you know, their documents and so on. Like 
for example, I don't know if you remember when they introduced the king, the kings and kings. So if you can show that your grandmother or great grandmother or great grandfather was born in the UK, mm -hmm. you can claim the UK citizenship. Mm -hmm. Yes? That was it wasn't a secret. It was put out there. Yeah? And then of course, only a group of people, you know, will fight for those things and then it will die off. What I'm saying is that we all have to keep our eyes open. Since now the Windrush has shown that actually you could have a government that will introduce these things and then say to you, well, we're going to remove them, we're going to detain them. And you ask, why? And they say, it's a law. You know, there's a law there that says, you know, that the estate agents have to look at your passport. You know, they have to check. The bank needs this uh, ID and so on and so forth. <coughs> um, you know, the doctors are, I know, you know, that maybe you don't realize it. There's a lot more people of, in authority who are asking you for your ID, you know? So you, you either show your, your um, um, driving license, or you show your passport, or things like that. But the, the, the fact is that when those things are now handed over to say to people who employ people, you have to employ the ones who have the right to be here. You know, then if you don't, we're going to find you. Of course, you have to check everybody. And then that's how the windrush thing starts opening up. You know, because the employers will say, we want to see, you know, that you have the right to work here. <laughs> As I said in the beginning, it's mainly the black people who look like we've just only come, you know. I can go anywhere in this country, apart from maybe some part of London, where people see me in the street and think that I've just landed, you know. And they, you know, and they believe it mm -hmm. until I have to show something that actually I haven't just landed. That's what I mean, that it becomes our duty to make sure that when they introduce these things, you know, that we are in a position as, you know, a people united to make sure that whatever our government is doing is fair, you know, for everybody. So that meant that in a workplace, if you have to check, because if you don't check, you know they're going to find you. And if you don't have your papers to show, then you don't have no job. You have to find your papers. So if you don't find it, you can't get a job. And if you, you know, don't have a job, you go to sign on, you don't have what is required, you still, you know, cannot get you know, and you have benefits and so on and so forth. So it's a lot more than just us trying to do the little bit that we are able to do. The bigger part of it is making sure that we are our brothers and our sisters keepers in terms of, you know, the work that we do as people and, and then the organizations linking up. And that linking up is like, for example, here you have people who are trade unionists, who are very active in the trade union, who will go to meetings and they will be screaming to themselves to say, why don't our members come to meetings? You know, you have your AGM, you, they can't come to, you know, stand for any post and they can't do anything and you think you're on your own. Well, brothers and sisters, look around. My people say, you know, if you don't visit other people, you think your goat is the worst behaved goat, you know, that eats all the vegetables in the garden, you know. But, you know, if you are a member of, say, a Labour Party, you find that when you go to a branch, in that branch maybe there's only a handful of you who's doing all the work and the others are not coming forward. So the time has come for us to really wake up and make sure that people get involved. And then don't complain if they treat you badly in your workplace 
and you get up and you're looking for your union to help you. Or because of your ignorance, you believe that your union is not doing anything for you. Because you haven't actually involved yourself in those activities. So when finally I have you know, to say you know, that um, I was told that I have to talk about myself. But um, I don't know if we have time to talk about that. But I can just say that I told you I came in you know, 1963. And um, the little bit of things that I did were, you know, looking around to see how I am going to do something to stop me from being angry about things that was happening to me and my family. Like in 1963, it wasn't against the law to say that you don't want a black person to get the job that you have the time. That was the law. So whoever is doing it is not breaking any laws. Yeah? And the same thing, you know, the person who advertised for the room, the reason why is because it wasn't against the law. So my position then was that I'm not going to allow those things to carry on. Something has to be done. But remember, you can't do it on your own. You have to do it with other people. Like my sister was asking you, I want to see those who are going to help me do this. Because she knows she can't do it on her own. You need other people to do it. So when I, get my, I got myself involved with other people, and then we joined the Tenants Association, and then we got into the union, we got into the Labour Party, we got you know, elected in different things, and we have children, and our children, schools, you know, needed some improvement, and so on and so on. <coughs> it's a long journey, but it has been a very useful journey, because by all joining together, we changed a lot of laws. It meant that you couldn't actually put those things out. You can still discriminate, you know, if you don't want black people to come and, you know, rent your room, but you're not going to put it out and tell them that because it's against the law. Yeah? The same thing goes with, you know, the jobs that you advertise, the people advertise. The same thing goes with, you know, the different laws that we have now that use you know, to be obstacles. But it doesn't stop the government from introducing new laws. And I believe, and part of my journey is being that the government or the council don't do any of those things that they do if they know that people don't like it. That's why they get away with it, because sometimes they hear those voices, the people who say that we're full up, you know, the people who say that there is, you know, something wrong with people who have different color. And they hear it and they want to make those people happy. And by the majority keeping quiet, they get away with it. So like at the moment, it's Europe that is going on. You turn the radio and you listen to other people. You hear the thing that is happening with the young black people and the police. And you hear people say, when they say, oh, we're going to put this one up. We're going to stop that one there. And you hear people say, well, what do you have to fear? If you haven't done anything wrong, they will stop you. So when you keep hearing that, keep hearing it, you know that something is happening. And the government who is that way inclined will introduce a law. They will put in regulations to make people happy, to make people vote for them, you know, to make people you know, dislike other people. Therefore, it's still our duty, our job, as trade unionists, 
as community members to actually engage ourselves to make sure that this wind rush, because at the moment it's a scandal, so they're doing everything they can. But watch it. If we don't keep the heat on, we stop. And the bit of it will, that is left, they'll find it. And you, five years, and you say, well, we thought we'd done, done something about it. But it's still going on. Therefore, every day, every minute, every second, we have to be on the watch. We have to be our brothers keepers and our sisters keepers. We have to be in the people who make sure that any oppressive you know, law, anything that is not fair, right? It might be all right for you because you're paid two pounds more than me, you know, but the fact that I am hungry, come to work, not able to do as much as I could, means that you have to do more because you fed yourself well and you learn and so on and so forth. So, I'm going to end the way I started by saying thank you for having me here today and I hope that the discussion we're going to have by the time we leave here will improve what my sister is asking you for and the connection which we have through you, one of yours, who dragged me from London to come here, will be fruitful that the next time I look, you know, something better has come out of what you are doing here through the different institutions. You have a law center, you have advice bureau, you have, you know, different groups that is helping to do things. Make sure, you know, that your council is funding those bodies. Make sure that you're checking out to, you know, to be in a position where there will never be any worries about you know, um, wind. <laughs> Gosh, I can't move forward. I mean, the wind rush. There's no, you know, we don't have to worry about that and all the other immigration and things that they will be bringing in through the European uh, Brexit. Thank you very much. <laughs>
those two environments, even though the city was like two miles away, three miles away from where I live, completely different culture. And I wonder what it's like now. And I doubt whether it's that much different, actually. Would you like to respond to that? Yeah, well, um, I suppose what you can say is because, you know, the whole thing is in inside the data system. Yeah. And because it's inside the system and people get used to it. Mm -hmm. And us, yeah. as black people, we get used to it as well because there is only one life. You know, there's a, you know, this much that you can take and then you, you just break down and die or something. Yes. You know, therefore, you know, you, you measure how you react to certain things. I can come here and address you the way I have addressed you. I can go, you know, next door and I see the kind of people that are there. I still want to do certain things, but I have to do it in a way, you know, that I don't lose my battle. Yeah? You know, so when you know, it's like when you are working your way through things, you know, you find say you go to a town, there's only two black families living there. And their children are the only black children in the school. They can go bang, you know, like a band on and in Tottenham. You know, because you know, they know that by the next day they're gone. You know, so they manage to to survive, and then maybe the children just can't wait to get away from that village and then move out. Um, but that is what survival is. Um, and then, you know, when you know what you feel, and you know that there is a solution, but then you have to be, you know, take your, you know, battle to where there are people who are going to help you find those. But things are changing. I mean, we have a, a law centre in Harringay, which is based in Tottenham. They, um, one group of solicitors who are helping, giving a bit of funding, are from the city. You know, a few weeks ago, you know, they came to see the work you know that we're doing. You know, with the uh, other man with the chain. You know, so it was like a big thing. There was six of them. You know, like. They've never been to Tottenham. They hear Tottenham, it was like a place where you don't go. <laughs> you know? So, but they come. And for them, when they write it up and tell their friends, you know, that they are doing this great work in, in, in Tottenham, you know, it gives them, you know, and their friends are envious, you know, that they, are, they have connections and so on and so on. So we can give up. We have different ways of dealing with it. Some of the soft way, to tell them that you are quite wrong, you know, that you know things have changed, we can't take any more of this. And then the other way, you know, is that you're trying to convince them, you know, to come, you know, your way. So when you, you don't live in Hackney anymore and you don't work there, you're here now. So you know, but you still remember what was going on there. So when I say that is changing, but it's so slow. And sometimes when you think that it's changed, that you can just now get on with your life, then something big happens, like this wind brush, and you're thinking to yourself, what is going on? I thought this was what we dealt with long time ago. So when you know, just keep our eyes open to make sure that um, we don't go back to where uh, we were before. Thank you, George. Two things. First of all, I'd like to thank um, for the work that you all have been doing in Harrogate, particularly David Lamy. Because I think David Lamy's speech in Parliament went viral. It was so moving. I, I just said, and I think for him to, um, we talked about standing and recounting. He certainly stand around all the other MPs and gave such a popular thing. I think if he hadn't have done that, probably the Home Secretary would still be in post. You know, um, so I, I really thank the work that, um, um, that um, David and Harry Gay is doing to raise that um, issue of, of the wing rush. I've heard about the story 
um, for my mom. My mom passed away, um, and she, um, her nephew um, um, were telling her that um, he was going to be deported. And she couldn't understand. She said to me, you surely you could be able to do something about it. But back in that day, my mother passed away about two years ago. And it was going on about four years. And I've heard stories about how they were actually, um, but I thought it couldn't be. I really thought that it wasn't possible until um, until the David Lamy and My cousin um, was, um, he's 66 now. He, four years ago, he was holding down a good job in, um, in the uh, borough of um, Hammersmith. Um, security men, he was a caretaker, two caretakers. They marched him out in front of everybody. They were security people and marched him. He was working and there was actually police and bodyguards. This guy is just, he's a small guy. So I grew up in Huddersfield and, and marched him. And for four years, <coughs> he couldn't actually work. He, he couldn't, um, you know, he, he was going to be, I don't know why he, he was on the verge of being evicted from his flat. And it was actually him. Um, and, and I was asking anybody, surely this, this was wrong. It can't happen in Britain and so on. And now, um, in the space of, um, of, of the speech and so on, they wanted to offer him the whole world, you know, just because of that. So I say that because of this story, because uh, lots of people are, have similar stories. But um, I think that um, um, we're quite a proud people, so we don't tell everybody uh, what we suffer in silence. And you know, I think that um, as somebody uh, born and bred in Britain, I'm ashamed, really ashamed, that this can happen in 2018. Really a shame. And I, um, and I want to do everything I can do to actually to stop it. Um, because like, um, they came for me, they came for my cousin yesterday, they'll come for me tomorrow. And the stand, you know, and I, 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 I agree with you, Amanda, that how we must take a stand. We cannot be uh, my mannered. This is wrong, brutally wrong, and we have to expose it. So I sent it all around the world, the David Lamy, and I constantly do that because actually, you know, and it happened, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person, it happened really at a time when, um, when the um, heads of government were here from the Caribbean. How shameful that was when the heads of the Caribbean government were here, you know, and, um, and they're asking them, can you help us? And the British government were asking them, can you help us? Can you make speeches? And people were sending letters to the government, and the government were sending letters to the UK government saying, this can't be wrong, this can't be right. And they were powerless to do anything about it. And suddenly, in a matter of days, everybody's actually sending letters um, around. So I think that how, I'm glad it's happened, um, but I think that how there's a lot more that, um, that we can do. And, it's, and we, uh, sorry if I get emotional about it, but I think that how um, we cannot um, be, um, sit silent about this, because it hasn't, um, although the town that the government is actually doing stuff, it will die down if we don't actually, people need to be compensated properly for, um, for the, um, <coughs> the, the, the distress it's caused them both mentally um, or, 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 and, and physically. Thank you, George. The gentleman there in the shop, shirt. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, my name's Nick Ruff. I'm the branch chair of Coatley's Unison. 
and uh, been involved in organising tonight's meeting and proud to do so. I'd like to thank Martha and Andrew and Amanda for, for speaking tonight. But I really wanted to take up George's point because it's a long time since I've seen you, George. It's good to see you, mate. Um, George said that David Lammy's speech brought down uh, Amber Rudd. Now, I think that's fantastic that Amber Rudd's gone. But actually, I think that David Lammy should have shouted a bit more and got rid of the more racist previous Home <laughs> Secretary, uh, Theresa May. Because not only was she the Home Secretary, she's now the Prime Minister of Britain, and she has been absolutely hands in the till, hands on the deportation orders in terms of the Windrush scandal. And the importance about the Windrush scandal is that it's absolutely blown the lid off a really racist immigration policy that this Tory government has carried out, not just since 2010, but before that, and unfortunately previous governments have been in that vein as well. And I think it's incredibly important what George says, because if people do stay silent, and I think it's not because of culture, it's because of fear. And that's what immigration policy means. If you are fearful, if you raise your head and you are not white, that you are likely to be deported, you're not going to raise your head. And that's what they like, and that's what racism is about. Why do they promote racism? Why do they like racism? Because it means that we are too much in fear, we're against each other, and we are the people that can oppose them. And when they, they talked about an hostile environment, it's a disgraceful way to describe an immigration policy. It's absolutely disgraceful. But that is exactly what they have created. And I think whenever they have an attack on anyone in our society, whether it's this time around in terms of the Caribbean community, or whether it be the Muslim community, the Islamophobia, that I think we have to say we are one. I am from the Caribbean, I am a Muslim, we fight together against the racists and those who want to divide us. And that's what our strength is, and that's what this meeting represents tonight. But I do want to take up the hostile environment theme, because someone is coming to this country on the 13th of July, and he is a racist, and he is a bigot, and he is the President of the United States of America. And I want to create a hostile environment when he comes to this country that we would all say he is not welcome here. We don't want people like Donald Trump to make an invasion because Britain does not accept that. And I tell you what, the biggest fear for me, if you look around the world at the moment, around Europe, there is a rise of the far right. You have Nazis in the government of Germany. Who would have predicted that in 1945? Last Saturday I was in Manchester opposing an organisation called the Football Lads Alliance who think it's absolutely appropriate to say that Muslims are not fit to live in this country. I oppose them and I'll continue to oppose them. I'll be there again on the 2nd of June when the Democratic Football Lads Alliance... I tell you, there are no lads, they're all geezers and they're a bit big and they're... Well, Get there with us, help us out. But we have to oppose racism at every level because the dangers we saw in the 30s. And I tell you, it's a disgrace that 50 years after Martin Luther King was assassinated, that we're sitting in this room talking about the Windrush scandal. It is an absolute disgrace and it's not the responsibility of us, it's those who run society who promote the racism. And therefore, I, I, I applaud Andrew and his colleagues for standing up to racism. 25% of the workforce on the bins are black and have to put up with racism from their management. And that's absolutely right that they said no, and that is the way in which you challenge racism. White and black together, Muslim and white together, whatever. Fighting together is the way we beat the racists, and that's what they've done on the bins. And I hope the councillors that are here tonight will take heed of that and say that there is no place in our workplace for racists to conduct the way in terms of making monkey chants, referring to people in the S word. I've not heard it for 25 years, but that's the sort of language that's been used on the bins. And it needs to be dealt with, and it has to be said it's not acceptable in our society in the 21st century. Basically, management backed out every demand that we put to them, and we are very confident that we will get what we want in the end. 
That's what we that's we throw seven and all say demands at them and they come back on every one of them so yeah you can have them all. So it's been a big big trip and that was the reason why we suspended the strike action. Yeah, so in respect of Kirklees, I can't answer that question because one of the things I tried to do was highlight it on social media, for example, and encourage people to come forward um, so that I could support them in any way I could if they were affected by this hostile environment. I haven't received any response, to be honest. But what I did do was I contacted um, the leader of the council and uh, chief exec, um, basically to request that if people are affected, that the council commits putting resources into helping these people, which I thought was really important. Because what I could see was there wasn't any um, publicity about it in Kirklees, which really concerned me. It sort of felt like it was a, a national thing, but we were excluded from that. So I thought it was important to highlight that, bring it to the attention of the council, for example, that these things are happening nationally, and it's likely that people might come out of woodwork or people may have already come out of the woodwork, but just be mindful that if it happens, then something needs to be done. I also contacted the Citizens Advice Bureau, which I thought was key, because the Citizens Advice Bureau provide a free legal advice service for people with a whole range of legal issues. I won't go into too much detail about the response that I got, but it was disappointing, to say the least. Um, so what I tried to do was encourage the Citizens Advice Bureau to be more <coughs> proactive about people approaching them for advice. So rather than just sending them away, you know, there needs to be a lot more. So what I've tried to do is engage the council and the Citizens Advice Bureau. Because to be fair to the Citizens Advice Bureau, unless there is funding for them to address these issues, then there's very little they can do because it's complex and it requires a specialist <coughs> minister who deals in immigration to get to grips with what's going on. So although the government has sort of indicated that there are things that they are doing, there's a helpline, there's a free advisory service, there's lots of other things. As the gentleman said, the problem in Kirklees is that people are fearful of coming forward. And what I don't want is for people to wait until the 11th hour to seek that advice. I want people to know that you know there is support available. I'm here, you know, the council are there, the Citizens Advice Bureau is there to support people confidentially if that's what they want. It doesn't have to be publicly. You know, as a solicitor, I'm well aware of confidentiality. Um, but haven't received any responses. So what I thought was I would work with the council to put the publicity out there. So if anybody wanted to approach the council of the Citizens Advice Bureau without me being involved in the equation, for example, they could do. And to date, no one's come forward. But I suspect there are people out there who are affected. And maybe they're sort of burying their heads in the sand. And I don't want them to do that. Hence the reason why I was desperate to get involved in, in, this, you know, in this debate. To you know, apply people's minds to how serious this can be. And how George says it could affect any of us. My understanding is if there is an issue with someone's immigration status, who's from the Windrush generation, it also impacts on their families and their generation. So for example, if my dad didn't have the correct status, my dad's over there by the way, um, if he didn't have the right status, then arguably I might not have status to be here. So I'm at risk of being deported. So it's bigger than the Windrush generation. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a community thing and we all need to be aware of it and we all need to know where we stand and get the right advice should we need it. But in, in terms of your point, because I saw your statement, I, I contacted my local MP. Um, and the reason why I did that, because although my cousin lives in Hammersmith, it was important that, that he got the information. If they burned the papers, um, that Kirklees would have the record that he went to um, both junior and secondary school and he worked in Kirklees. And I understand that um, the, the two MPs were working together. Should they actually, um, should the um, Home Office need any details? Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. The lady over there? Um, I think rather than us sat here waiting for people to come forward, we need to demand from the government to know exactly who's been affected over the last several years 
Because I'm really, really concerned that this legislation went on and it's only come to light now. And I'm absolutely convinced that Theresa May was relying on public apathy yes. over this issue. Yeah. And this concerns me. How many people have been affected over the last seven years? Mm. And we shouldn't be waiting for them to come forward. We should demand that the government go and bring them back. Relating to the um, idea of um, engagement, I, I just want, uh, I want to promote the idea of demonstration. Um, um, I mean, if we look at the Windrush case, all credit to Amelia Gentleman, the Guardian journalist who publicised this in the first place, but also the people who demonstrated in London um, a, a, against those stories and I think that that really without that that wouldn't that it wouldn't have become the issue it's become so I think you know demonstrating works and um, I, I should have said I'm secretary of Kirkley's standard to basis and I, I mentioned it to some um, brothers and sisters earlier um, the uh, so just thinking about what Nick was saying about Trump, and we got a good response, we, we need to demonstrate against Trump. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, and so there will be demonstrations against Trump, I'm absolutely sure. You know, there'll be a national demonstration, there'll be regional demonstrations, there'll be local demonstrations. And it's going to be difficult to juggle or make an own decide what it is. There's going to be that complication. But really, um, please, I, I mean, I wonder if I can pass around the Stand Up to Racism uh, list so that anybody who wants to know about the transport or the arrangements locally as soon as, you know, and any meetings to decide, can, um, can be, you know, we can contact them. Is, would that be? Thanks very much. And the, the other thing, just to complete that, is that Nick mentioned about the Manchester demonstration against the, the um, against the FLA? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, your name's George. Yeah. Yes, sorry, George. George mentioned, you know, they came for my cousin uh, last week. Uh, they'll come for me this week. Um, you know, it's a kind of uh, an adaptation of what was said about the Nazis, isn't it? You know that, that was what the the the, 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 uh, the they they came for the uh, whatever Protestants and um, the, I did not speak out and etc etc. Then they came for me. There was nobody to speak for me. Um, the Nazis continue to be a danger. They're small. They're tiny, and they don't look like it in Britain, but abroad. They're serious. There are 20 Nazis already, 20 or 40 actually, uh, um, in the German parliament. The German parliament, that is. Nazis. Hungary. Uh, and uh, dangerous, racist, right-wing ideas all over Europe. In Britain, we're doing well. But we're doing well because there's opposition and they're taking it serious. We're taking it seriously. There's very good news. There's a lot of opposition. I think this, the great thing about this Windrush thing is it's really put the uh, a racist government and the racists on the defensive. Even the BBC, which has been so culpable in the last year or two about racism and promoting the government's agenda, even the BBC today had a, an item about the... Um, well, I wrote it down. If, if he's good enough for you, he's good enough for me. Sitting in the mosque, that's where I want to be. Because uh, Mo Salah, you know, it's a Liverpool football chant, anti-racist to the core. And even the BBC made an item out of that today. And that shows we've got the initiative and we need to use it. 
So uh, I repeat, a week on Saturday, um, that's a week tomorrow, there's a coach going to London, and if you put your name on Manchester uh, uh, for the DFLA, and if you put your name on that, we'll be on to you to ask you if you want to go. Thanks. Thank you. Come on. I'm just wondering what our local member of parliament, Inspire Sherman, is doing about uh, raising awareness amongst local people. I noticed that in Manchester, members of parliament have held surgeries, and I've even had flyers on my, on my network, and I don't even live in Manchester. So I just wondered, there was also a, a letter that lots of MPs signed about, um, what was it about the investigation or some, um, I can't remember the basis of it, but something, something quite significant around the Windrush investigation, and I don't think our member of parliament signed it. So I'm just wondering uh, what, what he's doing. If anyone knows. Good question. <laughs> oh, he's a Tory. Sadly, I can't answer that question, but we are friends and I will find the answer to that and I will get back to you on that one. It's a very good question. The whole community needs to be It's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. It's a Imagine I got in touch with him as well. I think I got in touch with him about the next voice. And I've not had any response, so it's not just a case of getting back to those who yeah. are waiting yeah. it. So it's a, it's a serious answer. issue. Yeah. And I'm a Labour Party member. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I could, the lady over there at the back. Hi, I just want to say thank you, Amanda, for inviting me today. Um, there's a lot of people that are my kind of generation, 40s, 50s, that just don't cover the greenwash uh, generation. I want to know how can we get to try and find out what's happening with the actual windrush generation? Do they actually know that this was happening today? Because I think a lot of them, they don't use the media like how we use the media. That's the first thing. How can we get them to get involved? And the second thing is, what can we do to change the legislation and the laws for immigration? Because I think this is going to be a cycle. So I think I'll get older, and then it will become a problem for my son and my daughter. So what can we do to change the laws and, and the legislation? OK. Do you want to answer that? Um, I'll chip in, maybe a bit later on. Uh, yeah, can you just answer some of them? Yeah? yeah. Do you answer this one, or do you want to do it? Um, I'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> The last one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what can we do? Um, well, I mean, the, uh, for example, the LP, why don't you tonight decide when you're going to visit his surgery? Not one, not two, quite a few of you go and visit so he can update you on what's going on about the uh, windrush. Because you see, if you write to an MP who maybe you know is not really too interested, maybe never had any client, uh, any any constituent who's been to him to talk about the immigration position, you might not reply. But you've had this meeting. You're talking about Windrush. There's a few things that you, with well, the MPs, you know. They, that's where uh, the government says to people, visit your MPs. Don't go pay any lawyer or anybody. Visit your MPs, come to the home office, and so on. So when, you know, don't just send one person, quite a few people, and just go one evening when the surgery is open to say, we want to talk about one thing. We've heard about it. How many have been to your surgery? Um, we are worried that there might be, you know, windrush people who are hiding somewhere, not have no job, not feeding themselves, and not coming out. Mm -hmm. We want them to come out, and what are you going to do? We want to work with you so that we know what's happening in Huddersfield, mm -hmm. in Kegley's. You know, um, I don't know how many MPs you've got. We just visit them. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, coming to um, your point about uh, David Brani. I mean, you know, like everything else, 
you know, he is, you know, Tottenham MP, and you can't be Tottenham MP if you're not going to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we had, um, you know, Bernie Grant, the Tottenham MP, you remember him, you know, we lost him. You know, so we got David Lamy, you know, so on, you know, you, you make people who represent you, represent you by making sure that they speak, you know, what you want them to speak. And if you don't visit their thing as a group, you know, they're not going to take you seriously. You know, if you just leave them, they collect their wages and they go home and next time they want you to vote for them and so on and so forth. I'm not saying make life uncomfortable for them, I'm just saying, you know, just have conversation, you know, with them, you know, so that all the things that is worrying you that the government is doing over there, you know, is dealt with. And the other part of it is, you know, the, the um, wind rush issue is not because there is um, a bad law, you know, what the, if, if you listen carefully, what Theresa May and all of them are saying, this is to get rid of illegal immigrants. Remember? That's what they're saying. And nobody is going to say, no, we don't want illegal immigrant, immigrants to leave. You know? But the thing is, when you then use <coughs> this to apply to the ones that you shouldn't apply to, then it means that, and you close your eyes, and then you don't find the papers, and you don't know how many you put on the, uh, on the plane to go back, then you know that there is another agenda on the road. And, and that is an eye-opener. It helps us to make sure that the other things are open, so that you know what is happening with all the other different laws you know, that they are coming up with. And I think just to kind of, you know, ride on the back of that, Marie, um, the, there has been a lot of publicity and a lot of people in Huddersfield do know about it because people have approached me at um, certain events or in the street and what have you. But you're right, we don't know how many people don't know about it. I know about the people who know, I don't know about the people who don't know. And I think it's important that debates like this happen so that we can all understand what the issues are and more importantly, we've got a number of politicians in this room, although I haven't introduced everybody. In the corner of there, we've got the leader of the council, and I'm pleased to see him here, and we've got uh, another councillor over there. We've got a councillor at the back there. <laughs> Myself. So it's really important that we understand what the residents of Kirklees are saying, and we come to grips, get to grips with what the issues are, because the, we then, are responsible, as the lady said, for making policies in Kirklees. We're also um, able to take this information further in terms of lobbying our MP, lobbying the government, you know, kicking up a fuss, making issues. You know, we're here to represent the community. So I can go out there and say, I've been to this meeting and I'm speaking on behalf of the community. So there are things that we can do as politicians, which is important. Um, but in terms of changing the law, that's where we all must, you know, feed that information back to our MPs and again lobby the government and make sure the government know how we feel. And a good way of teaching the government how we feel is when you go out to vote. If you're not happy with what the government's saying, what the rhetoric is, then you don't vote for that government, you vote for someone else, someone who speaks to what you stand for. So, you know, I know I'm a little bit biased, but, you know, for example, the Labour government, this isn't something that the Labour government would do. It, it's far from the ideology of the Labour government. So it's up to you what you do on polling day, but you speak with your pen. You have power with your pen. Uh, and, and that's when you let the government know how you feel about the situation. The young gentleman at the front, my husband, <laughs> has a question. <laughs> well, you more or less said what I was going to say there. But, um, so I'll say something different. It's, it's just great to see that firstly so many black people from Huddersfield have actually turned up for this today which I see as maybe a catalyst, a, a start because um, I go to all types of different events that have been organised, put together and um, basically to fight the cause for our black community 
and in many cases sometimes I might be the only black face that's there and I think that it's quite poignant that so many black people have turned up today and we need more of that because I think it's great that we've got you there Amanda but at the same time you need that support um, I mean we mentioned about Barry Sherman and I think in terms of community responsibility, public responsibility, um, we need to be contacting him ourselves as well. We, we, we need to be making, making him know, right, that you know what, you want the vote, this is what we want. And maybe as a community, we haven't been strong enough or as organised enough over the last 20 years or so of actually putting our agenda together and delivering it at the same time. Um, in the 70s, early 80s, I was, I was around, I guess you call it the Black Power Movement. My mum used to take me on all the marches um, and I'd be there at the meetings, sat down in the corner taking a tea and I think we need to get some more of that back in. Today I see the start of something and it's great to see the integration in the room as well to show that we're not alone in our cause. Thank you. Sorry, there you can. I just want to say something about keeping your eye on the ball. I saw a worrying video uh, today from an Indian news channel. <laughs> and there's a pilot scheme for about six countries, I think Nigeria might be one of them, um, with, you know, obviously foreign looking people in them. But there's now a £3,500 visa charge for six months. Because, this, you know, this was what the reporter said, because these are, the, these are the people that are most likely to break the rules, the visa rules or whatever. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's only these countries where people look foreign that are being targeted, if you like. So, you know, it's not, it's not our citizens as such. But it's still, it, it, it's showing more of their attitude, really. Um, you know, maybe preventing families from getting together and stuff as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're absolutely on it. Even in the night of the Windrush, they're still at it. Yeah. I think to link with that, there was something in the, the Guardian today about the Caribbean, I don't know if anyone saw it, about Jamaica. And what, what they were saying in there is that people who have been deported from the Windrush generation who maybe have gone on holiday or gone to a funeral, gone to a wedding, and are unable to return to the country, have approached the embassy in Kingston, Jamaica, for example, and these embassies are not supporting people to return back to the UK. So there's an issue on that side. And there's one gentleman, I think, um, who'd been deported 25 years ago, and he's been fighting to get back into the country. He came here when he was nine, he's from the Windrush generation. But it seems as though, I don't know, the government's in cahoots with possibly the government over there. Don't know. Don't know. The lady over there, she's been waiting patiently. Thank you. I just want to start by saying, I'm sorry, but I disagree with you. I don't think this is a good enough turnout. You can always do better. It's not even the point. 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 And I don't, yeah. We should have more people yeah. in dental work. Um, and I think the fear, I think that's the key, it's the fear. I'm here with my mother in law who is a new brush child. Um, and she doesn't have a computer on the phone. She doesn't have a British passport. We've talked about this for a few years because we've been hearing horror stories and we've been saying we need to sort it out, we need to get her passport. But then on the back of that we've been saying, well, actually should we even start this conversation with people because are we going to start something and then they're going to realise she doesn't have a passport and they're going to send it back. And I think the fear is that even now it's in the media, people still don't know exactly what's going to happen when we come forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need, they need to be told, that X, Y, and Z is going to happen if you come forward. And maybe that might bring more people out on the work and see, in a way, because he was one thousand and I've been here since when I was eighteen. I've got my um, national insurance and everything. And I couldn't put for the British passport because it's too much. And my mother died now. She was trying to go, unfortunately. 
trying to succeed. They're not making it clearer of what we've got to do. Like I, I'm computer literate, I'm an educated person, I've been online and I still don't know what she needs to do. It's not clear enough. And not everybody is computer literate. And when we're thinking about the generation who is affected, they're not all computer literate. We can't all go and live ahead. We don't, yeah, so it needs to be clearer, much, much clearer, and much easier. Yeah. Yes. We need, to, we need dedicated yeah. surgery yeah. Yeah. to yeah. deal with this issue specifically. Yeah. To know what, what we have to do, yeah. how we do it, how long it's going to take, and what happens when we've done it. Yeah. Because yeah. that's where the fear comes from that we'll know. I was going to pay that thousand, that's because I'm not paying it. I've got the national insurance, I've been working on the last year, going to school. The council will need to step up now to follow the do. Yeah, they do. and tell them they what do. it is that they can get. Because it is exactly what you just said. They are fearful. They yeah. don't know this. They don't know the unknown. And that's it. What what do you get if you come forward? Are you going to get to talk to them? You need to tell them the council needs to do more. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point. I know and um, Shaker the back wants to speak. And the government do this on purpose. This is clear with muddling. Yeah. You know, if it was clear, then everybody would know where they stand. And they don't want people to know where they stand. They want to create confusion. So that, that's the ethos behind that. But you're right, you know, there needs to be dedicated surgeries. But as I pointed out earlier on, <coughs> no one has really come forward. We don't know what the situation is. Yeah. I'm really glad that you've come along today. You know, these issues have been highlighted. So at least I can take things away with me. And obviously, I, I know you, so I can... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's meet up. 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 Shake at the back. Yeah, um, Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm, a, I'm an elected member for 13th, but I also work part time for a member of parliament, not by shoe. Um, and I think, it's just going back to what this lady said here the fear and the tradition of what they're, they're going to do just links into exactly what Martha said that there is a dedicated helpline for MP staff that will directly get us to the Home Office. So if you went to see whoever your member of parliaments are, there is a dedicated line and there is a dedicated team that will work on that application and give you the advice and support that you need. Which brings me on to the second point pretty nicely is what Amanda said, which is the Home Office itself, without sounding overtly political, it is one of the biggest bureaucracies, whether it's the Windrush scandal or whether it's anything else, and it's designed in a systematic way to not give the information so the Home Office they're not left with egg on their face and they don't look as if they they know they don't know what they're doing. I mean one of them has had to already fallen this sword and they certainly don't want two to fall on this sword because that would be absolutely uh, terrible. But it, the, the, what I would recommend is in the first instance please don't go and speak to a lawyer and, and waste your money doing that because MP staff are equipped to get the information from the Home Office a lot quicker than solicitors and lawyers and there is a dedicated team so please do see your MP. It's, it's all well and good saying that. I mean I have two residents in Dalton affected by it but they're so fearful of what might happen once they actually give their information even to an MP's office. I have said to them I can take this forward to Barry Schumann and we can look at what we can do about it. I think we need a different approach to this. I, I think... Yeah. Can I just bring yeah. back on that? I, I, I completely appreciate that, that, that people are in fear and they don't know what's going to happen. But I can quite honestly say right now, I don't think, or I think it's very unlikely that an immigration officer would come to the house and deport them straight away. The reason for that is because after you're in the UK, whether you're English or not, you have settlement rights, settlement rights. But it's not just the being in heart and where are you in horror stories about people being placed in detention centers? Yeah, people are coming straight back on a plane. Yeah, that's why I would say it's meeting, please. Yeah, indeed. I don't think. Yes, it is. It you, you're saying that people don't hate, but they were here. I'm working on the ground. Yeah. That the, the, the cases yeah. that I've got yeah. in push yeah. are people that have been here for okay. many, many years and, yeah. and, and, and they're fearful of they might not have the correct paperwork, they might not be in the correct room, they might not have the need correct to process. So and I've dealt with things like that in the whole process. Well, that's what you need to be 